Hey everyone, it's Dr. Rick. I wanted to talk about iodide. I went off trail and I found this little gem. So if you look over here, this white uh, ice patch is a lake. It's going through this dam. There used to be a bridge there, I'm sure. And it's sending it downstream to wherever I'm gonna be going to in a second. So the reason I'm thinking about this is that uh, I have a lot of patients, and if you're watching, you probably have been told by me that you should be getting on iodine. If we take iodine in our average diet, a good amount of it in our eggs, in our meats, in our seafood, in our seaweed, in our fish, and it gets into your bloodstream after you eat it, in your food sources or your pills, it sits over there in the lake or the bloodstream. For the iodide to get into the cell, let's just say this is all the cell, got to pass through the cell wall. So you got to get from the bloodstream over there, through the cell wall, into the cell. When the iodine gets into the cell, it binds with thyroglobulin, and that's one of the uh, antibodies I'll be testing you for, and it makes mono, di, tri, and tetra iodothyronine. It's prepped, cleaved up, divided into T1, T2, T3, T4, and then once it's divided, it goes back into the lake or into the bloodstream, and then it makes wor things work properly. The most active T's of the four of them is T3 and T4. T4 is the one we typically will check in the office. I always like to see free T3 and free T4, especially if you're on medicines. So if it is getting into the lake or into the bloodstream, you should have good amounts. You combine that with the TSH that I'm getting, that's a thyroid stimulating hormone, and then we can kind of figure out how good your thyroid is working, how your brain is happy, how much thyroid hormones in the blood, and maybe an iodine test to see if you're even getting the building block in for all that stuff. The problem I found in the Midwest especially is this used to be called the goiter belt because there wasn't enough iodide in the soil. So if there's not enough in the soil or the feed, then people will wind up getting hypothyroid. That's underactive hypothyroid. And then you get a big nodule here called the goiter, and uh, you have the symptoms of underactive thyroid, like constipation, weight gain, depression, hair loss, brittle nails, skin problems. Well, back to testing whether there's enough iodide in your bloodstream, in your diet. Well, if you're eating a well-balanced diet, mostly organic, you should be okay. If you have any of those symptoms I mentioned of as far as hypo or underactive thyroid, it would be worth testing the full thyroid panel in addition to iodide. So it's usually a spot urine test in the morning off of your supplements. That'll give you an approximate, and if you're anything lower than 50, it's probably worth it to be taking an iodide supplement. The more accurate test would be a load test, sometimes not paid for by insurance, but you take a, a certain amount of iodide in the morning, and then you check your urine from that point in the morning until 24 hours later, and then they measure how much iodide you secrete or you pee off. If you end up peeing off everything you took the morning before, then the likelihood is that you're not able to absorb iodide. Sometimes that's something called a symporter problem, or you just have to be on selenium. The problem is, again, selenium's not paid for by Medicare and some insurances, and 24-hour iodide testing's not paid for. So, if I find we're gonna have a problem, I just go ahead and assume you have a low iodide, I'll take that spot urine test in the morning, and then we'll see how you do with your symptoms and your blood testing after about three months of supplementation. You have to be careful because if you're on thyroid supplement now and you take iodide, you potentially can get hyperthyroid or overactive thyroid. And that'd be the opposite of what I mentioned with underactive thyroid. Some people call that a jod based cell reaction. Uh, I haven't heard that in a while, but just know that you have to be careful. So be aware when you are supplementing and if it becomes too uncomfortable to take the supplement, then you get back to me via the portal or you talk to your endocrinologist. As far as changing your iodide level with your food source and your nutrition, I would always say that would be important first. The only problem is you have to assume that your farmers and your livestock owners are putting iodide in the feed and in the soil. 
and then you have to assume that it's being absorbed into your products that you're eating then you have to calculate with the products you're eating how much eating you have to do to get to the RDA of 125 to 150 micrograms a day. And that's really confusing. If you're already underactive and you're trying to diet, I'd hate for you to be taking in more food just to make up the iodide, especially when we're not sure if it'll work. I would rather have you do a trial of taking the supplement, seeing if it truly makes the symptoms turn around, and then deciding what to do after three to six months. If we found that you have antibodies like TPO or thyroglobulin that are positive, then you probably have a form of Hashimoto's or an autoimmune disease that's causing the thyroid not to work right. But if you've read Dr. Brownstein's information, he has a good hypothesis about the fact that low iodine might cause you to have a problem with the antibodies starting to be produced. Uh, I'm not sure everybody believes that in the medical community, but I like it and I would still say before going towards the issues with autoimmune disease, work on the iodine first because most of us are deficient on it. First thing I would do would be to use antioxidants to bring down the antibody response. And if you have a cholesterol problem, I'm probably going to suggest you get on antioxidants anyway. Omega-3 fish oil, turmeric, maybe even high dose vitamin C. Don't forget selenium is important for that sim porter, that iodine transport chain to be working and taking iodine into the cell. Selenium can be found over the counter. In addition to multiple Bs, B3, B2, and then your B12, if you're already B12 deficient, are important as basic building blocks. With regards to starting this whole process up, I think it is important to get those baseline tests. That would be TSH, free T3, free T4, TPO antibody, and thyroglobulin antibody iodine urine levels, maybe an iodine 24-hour load test, and then finally an ultrasound to see what the anatomy looks like. These are all expensive and if you have a high deductible, you might be eating your deductible. The question about whether you use synthetic thyroids, porcine-derived thyroids, desiccated thyroids, compounded thyroids, I think they all have their usefulness. Some of them might be expensive, some of them might be covered, but it essentially comes down to whether you take T4 by itself or T4 and T3. As far as whether it's synthetic or porcine derived, that's pig derived, uh, I'll leave it up to you guys. It really has to be a sustainable thing because you'll be doing it for life. So I guess it depends on how much you want to pay. I think there's benefits and drawbacks to whatever you choose. But again, this has to be a sustainable thing. Using the thyroid supplements, do make your symptoms better fast but you still have to get to a balanced lifestyle nutrition exercise weight control and mindful practice in addition to expecting that as you age the amount that you need will probably change and as your disease process changes the amount you need might have to change again so you still have to get into a doctor every once in a while even if you have this stuff controlled so hopefully this has been helpful. Don't forget to give me a thumbs up, a frozen thumbs up, and subscribe to me for weekly words of wisdom. I'm burning up film time. Damn it. Airplane, hold on. I don't know if you can hear that. I just don't want to interfere with my recording.